Hey guys, I'm going to teach you some of my tricks that I use for making pizza or basically ba make, baking anything with yeast and dough and all that sort of thing, so pizzas or uh, bread and, and so on. So the main thing I want to look for is type OO flour. This one here is often used for pizzas. Uh, this is the symbol, like I think it comes from Italy. Uh, that's the one you want for pizza. Uh, use a different type of flour uh, for cupcakes and cookies because you don't really want something chewy. You want something that's really soft and uh, not much bite. But Pizza and bread is the exact opposite. You want that chew, you want that uh, chewiness and, and structure. So that comes from the extra protein content in the type OO flour. Protein in this case would probably be things like gluten. It makes a bit of like elastic long chains. We call them polymers in chemistry and they will make a fibrous network. So the more you stir it with, with liquid, so that'll be the water that you add later on, um, they will start to make polymer chains when you start mixing them together. And then when the yeast does its thing where it eats all the sugars and carbohydrates and that warmth and, and, and moisture, uh, they will start to, start to make carbon dioxide gas or other gases which makes it have that beautiful smell and that basically inflates the dough from the inside to the outside but if you don't have much polymer chains here they tend to just escape and you don't really have a really nice puffy light uh, and chewy uh, breadcrumb so type of flour but I've learned that it's probably best to keep your uh, flour stored in the freezer so that the critters don't grow in there uh, you know if you leave it for a few you know six months down the road you may find your flour is no good anymore but the problem with the freezer is that it's too cold. Too cold for what? Well, too cold for yeast. When you make up yeast, you really want it to be nice and body, like a nice body temperature, nice and warm, lots of sugar and all sorts of things for it to sort of activate again. Um, ice cold flour is not gonna work very well. So I need to bring it up to temperature. One of the techniques that I've been using lately is just to use the microwave. So I take my flour, I add it to a bowl, and then I just take it to the microwave. Stick it in the microwave, zap it for 30 seconds, bring it out. It tends to make the surface uh, or the edges very warm, but not necessarily the center of it. So I just use a whisk, give it a bit of a stir, and then zap it for another 30 seconds. Once I'm all done, I can bring it out, and it's pretty much um, good to go. I usually stick it into my Mix Master, which is basically a, a robot that has a mechanical arm to stir it for me. And I'll give you the next tip in the, in the next video. All right, tip number two is how to make your bread dough rise relatively quickly using some techniques we use in chemistry all the time. The technique is called a hot water bath. Before I get to what the hot water bath is, we basically to the stage where we've added our yeast and flour and, and, and uh, water. And so we've got uh, basically a bread dough. Obviously this is still the flour I had earlier. My bread dough is already done, but I'm gonna show you the technique that I use so you can make bread dough, bread dough rise any time of the year, whether it's summer or winter. It works every single time. So. What is a hot water bath? Let me show you. So this is something that we use in our chemistry lab. So here we've got our heat proof mount, Bunsen burner tripod, and we basically have a very large beaker filled with water. You uh, bring the water up to temperature so you can make it boil or whatever temperature you need, and you submerge another container in the middle. So that could be where our bread dough is. And that makes it easy for heat to get distributed from all sides, nice and evenly, uh, for, uh, for whatever it is that we're doing in chemistry at the time. But if that technique works in the lab, why can't we use it in the, in the home when we're, using, when we're doing things in the kitchen? So I decided that, uh, well, since it's, let's say eight o'clock at night, it's not exactly sunny uh, to make the bread dough rise. What I tend to do is I just get my bread dough I'll cover it up so that it doesn't get too crusty and dried out on the surface. And I make myself a little hot water bath using the kitchen tap here. So it's on hot water. I fill it up, not all the way. And then I let that sit there and float. And then that usually gets done in about 30 or 40 minutes. Whereas the usual tends to take about an hour for, for the bread dough to, to double in size. I will catch you in the next bit of tip for the final bit that I'll show you in a minute. So once you've uh, made the dough rise and you've rolled it out and you've got a pizza dough ready to go into the oven, now we get to the stage of basically what do you put it in? And most people tend to go for a pizza stone. Now this is not a pizza stone, this is just something I have in my kitchen. I don't own a pizza stone anymore. And then the reason because is that they were kind of rubbish. Uh, everyone says, oh, pizza stones are the greatest. It makes the pizza, you know, nice and crispy in the middle of the dough and, and, and it keeps it, you know, uh, it gives you that crunch that you that uh, that I find really appealing. So I bought a pizza stone. What what happened? Well, it tended like all the sauce would drip over the pizza and then soak into the stone. You couldn't wash it off. It was a lot of mess, and still it wasn't that crispy. 
So, it wasn't until I noticed this other YouTuber called Alex Guy, sorry, French Guy Cooking, his name's Alex. He talked a bit like this, I will show you how to make pizza. He is wonderful. And uh, he actually showed me this technique on that video and I was like, that's brilliant. It's totally harnessing the power of scientific uh, 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 material, uh, sorry, the properties of material. So what uh, the difference is, is that instead of using a stone, Alex, the French guy from the cooking channel, he uses steel, or I think he might use like a, a, a thick piece of aluminium. I, I think it's basically a giant metal plate. And the reason why this works so much better than a pizza stone is that stone can't transfer heat out as fast as steel can. Okay, so this is due to a property called thermal conductivity. So if I was to put my hand in both of these two objects, the steel feels colder than this uh, uh, ceramic uh, stand-in for a pizza stone. Now, what's going on here is that the reason why this feels so cold to the touch, they're the exact same temperature. They've been living in my kitchen all day long. They're the same temperature, but they feel different to the touch in terms of coldness, uh, sorry, temperature. The reason is because this metal is so fast sucking the heat out of my hands that makes my hands, the sensation in my hands makes it feel cold. Vice versa, if I make these two um, objects to the same high temperature and I place my hands on it, this will transfer the heat to my skin faster than this one will. So I will literally burn my hand in fractions of a second on the steel than I will on the ceramic stone. So use this. Why are we using this instead of a stone? Uh, there's another pr uh, reason is that our ovens just can't, the ones we have in our kitchens, just not as hot as the ones they have in those you know, beautiful pizzerias where they have like a stone uh, furnace and they have like the really big spatula. Those ones there compensate for the stone not transferring heat very well. They compensate it by just making the temperature really, really, really hot. We don't have access to that, but we can use science to transfer the heat that we can get really, really, really fast. And we call this, uh, I think it's, uh, there's a name for that property where you can, uh, it can conduct really fast uh, from any material. Uh, the other thing that steel can do that ceramic can't is that it can actually hold more energy in it. It can store much more heat energy. So even if I rise to the same temperature, all right, so let's say it's 300 degrees Celsius, this will have stored more heat energy in it than the ceramic will. That means that not only will it transfer faster to the bread, it'll also have more heat to give to it for longer. So think of it like a battery. It has more, it can last longer on this battery than that battery, and it can drain the energy out of the battery much faster. So here's what we're gonna to do to charge it, is we're gonna get this as hot as we can. So if you wanna come around this way to our oven, and I'm just gonna stick it, uh, usually the top part of your oven has like a grill, so it's basically inside of a toaster, and I wanna put that on the top shelf, close it, and you are going to preheat this as hot as it can go. So you want to look for the grill and maybe fan forced. I usually use both, it can't be harm harmful. It won't work if you only use fan force. Trust me, I've tried that, it's pretty lackluster. Then when it comes to temperature over here, you basically want to crank it as high as it possibly can go in your oven and obviously turn it on. Now the thing, if you want to pull back for a second, the thing is that when you use this technique, um, one of these mittens is not enough. It is so hot on that handle that I typically grab that handle with two of these. So I'll have my hand in one mitten and I'll grab the other mitten, then grab the handle and lift it out. So that's part of the reason why I've got a wire, wire mesh rack here. So I can just quickly put it up there without sort of doing any heat damage to my surfaces. I'll catch you in the next video. I will prove to you how quickly this thing can cook the bread dough in the next tip. And we're back. It's finally preheated. So I've charged it full of heat energy and uh, I've rolled out some of my bread dough, so here we go. If you want to come around and follow me this way, um, I'll just leave this gently here for a minute and retrieve the frying pan. Something I forgot to mention last time is you want to make sure the frying pan has a steel handle, not a plastic handle, otherwise mum or dad or you will be very cross. Ah, it's not coming off. Ah, oh, all right, it's stuck. I'm gonna sit still for a second. If you go really close, you can hear it. So already you can hear it uh, frying away. So usually what I find is by the time I finish putting the toppings on, the bottom is already cooked. So here we go. And 
my wife wants margarita, so I'll just put uh, cheese on top. Might just add some of that sauce to the edges. And the real hard bit is to not burn your hand, <laughs> not burn your fingers on any part of this thing because it is screaming hot. And all it takes is about five minutes. So while it's in, while, while it's in there, something that you basically just do it by eye. So if you start to see caramelization uh, occurring where it starts to go like a nice golden brown on the surface, that's pretty much done. Um, that's another very famous chemical reaction, which we'll get into another video, but that's what you look for when you pull it out and it's beautifully done. All right, see ya. Okay, it's done. So I'm just gonna take it out of the oven. Oh, oh, I forgot it's too hot. Look at that. I'm just gonna reach around and I've lost it. Here it is. You can hear how crispy it is. And you can feel how crispy it is. See all that nice and crispy right in the middle of the bread dough. And uh, that's it. So there's basically my tips of how to make pizzas using science. All right, catch you guys in the next video. Bye.